Hi y'all, this is a solution video for our Weensy memory map IO exercise in which we take a little operating system that can do this, namely read a bunch of data from a RAM disk over and over again, and gradually introduce not only writing to the RAM disk, but then checking arguments and finally memory map IO. Um, this exercise is a relatively big exercise. We are taking two class days on it, although many of you may have finished it on your own offline. So I'm going to go through the exercise relatively quickly, just in the interest of uh, making the video tolerable. Uh, some of the uh, side discussions that we would normally have will leave off to other videos. So let's begin. Here we are in our kernel 3x directory. We're first asked to uncomment the body of pwriter.c and make a syswrite system call. All right, fair enough. So here's pwriter.c. Going to uncomment the body of pwriter.c. Try and compile. And in fact, it does not compile because we have no syswrite system call. Now, system calls are defined in three parts in WeenCOS. Um, and we need to add all of those parts. So first, we need the wrapper. So this is unprivileged code that executes in a process. And that is in process.h. The second part is we need an interrupt number. So all system calls in WinCOS are implemented by interrupts. We need a separate interrupt number for each process. That's defined in lib.h. And finally, we need the kernel implementation. And that goes in kernel.c in the exception function, because a uh, system call is, of course, a kind of exceptional control flow. So let's start off with the wrapper code. So Read and write are basically very similar, same in outline. They take very similar arguments. So let's just copy our version of read and make it instead a version of write. So read is a lot like write is a lot like read, except that the buffer argument is read only. So we can we pass a const void star there rather than a plain void star. I'm going to just get rid of all of these comments. We're passing the same arguments to syswrite and in, that we do to sysread and in the same order. So the first argument we pass is a buffer, the second is an offset, the third is a size. These magical characters here essentially define which registers are used to pass those values. So for instance, this line says, Dear compiler, load the value SZ into the register RDX before executing the interrupt instruction. That's what it means. So here we're loading buff into RDI, off into RSI, and size into RDX, which is exactly what we want. Finally, we need a new system call number. Since we're not making the read system call, we're making the write system call. And so I will define that number in lib.h down here as we define the other system call arguments. So in sys right is in sys plus four. Okay. So what will happen if we make run now? Ah, parenthesis. Why is the system call number defined in lib.h where the wrapper is defined in process.h? Well, the wrapper is meaningless in the kernel. So we define the wrapper in a header file that the kernel never includes. However, the kernel and the wrapper need to agree on the system call number, so we put system call numbers in a file that they both include, namely lib.h. Okay. Uh, yes, and make run. Up, oh, unexpected exception 52. So that's because we have done the wrapper, we have done the system call number, but we haven't done the kernel implementation. So let's turn to that! Whoa! That was a sneeze, excuse me. <laughs> we'll leave that in. Okay, so just as write has similar arguments to read, it also has a similar implementation to read. So let us start by handling both in sys write and in sys read in the same block of code. 
So just as with read, writes arguments are the same. So buff, off, and size are passed in the same registers. The only difference is the direction of the copy. So memcopy copies data into its first argument from its second argument. So the order of arguments to memcopy is destination, source, size. For read, we are copying data out of the RAM disk and into the user's buffer. For write, we want to do the other way. So if syscall is in sysread, we'll see how to implement that soon, then leave the mem copy the way it is. Otherwise, switch the arguments so that we're copying into the RAM disk from the buffer. Okay, that's as simple as it gets. Now, how do we tell whether the current system call is in sysread? Well, all of this code is in a switch statement off of the system call number. And it turns out that the system call number is stored in reg arrow reg underscore int no. That is, what kind, what kind of exception happened to cause this exceptional control for answer. So if we are in the sysread exception, then do a read, otherwise do a write. This should compile and run. And it does. And if we're patient, we'll see, ah, check it out, 61 is appearing. So just like we would hope, or just like I would hope, the write is actually succeeding. So we should take a moment to explain exactly how this code is working. The RAM disk is initialized with a series of hexadecimal alphabets, 0 through f. Um, read reads 16 bytes of those random alphabets, of those alphabets at random offsets. Write writes 61 space into the RAM disk at random offsets. So as the read and write proceed in parallel, what we expect is for the 61s that the writer is writing to gradually overwhelm the hexadecimal alphabets that were the initial state. And that's what we're seeing. And if we waited long enough, we would see it even more. OK, so that is the first portion of the uh, problem set done. Second portion, system call checking. Our implementation of sysread doesn't check its arguments. As a result, a process can kill the kernel by calling sysread and likely syswrite too. To verify this, change either pReader or pWriter to kill the kernel. So we want to kill the kernel. How can we do it? Well, let's think about what in this uh, system call implementation is unsafe. It is safe to access the process structure, which contains the processes current registers. That's fine. It's also fine to modify that process structure. Here we're setting the return value of the system call, which is the size, into the return register, which is regrax. It is unsafe, however, to copy memory around. And in particular, it is very unsafe to copy memory into a location that the process specified, right? Buff is just an argument to the syscall. It could be anything. It could be null. It could be minus one. It could be like the kernel's uh, code address. It could be anything. Similar, so that's unsafe. Similarly, it is unsafe to access data that it, at a random offset into the RAM disk. And uh, off is a user argument, it's unchecked. And it's unsafe to copy a random, to, to copy an unverified amount of data. And size is a user argument, and it's unchecked. So all three of the user's arguments to the read or write system call are important to check, and we're not checking any of them. Let's verify that a modification to any of those uh, arguments can cause a problem. I'm going to open up pReader, and we'll comment out the original read. And instead, we'll just start putting random values into the read. So our operating system has one page table. That's all that this operating system has. It doesn't have per process page tables. Um, however, the operating system is configured with a relatively small amount of physical memory and a relatively small amount of virtual memory. If we try and access a large address, this will fail. So here's three ways to do that. First, we could just provide a large address as the buffer. That will attempt to copy data into that large address. There's nothing there. The kernel should fail. And it does. We get a kernel page fault for accessing that address that the user gave us. Okay. We tried to write to that address, and we saw a missing page. And the instruction pointer for the, where that page fault occurred was 4241F. 
if we looked up that address inside of kernel.sim kernel or kernel.asm, we would see that that is within the mem copy in the int sys read case. Okay? So that is exactly what we would expect. It's, we do not want the kernel to access invalid memory. That generally indicates a serious error. The kernel needs to verify that memory is valid before accessing it. Okay, that's argument one. What about argument two? Well, if we try to read from a very large offset, that too will explode. Different faulting address now, because that's an offset from 4C000, which is the base of the RAM disk. We'll get the same thing if we try and read a ton of bytes. So I'm now playing with the size argument. Same thing, same phage fault. But we can cause even worse things to happen. What, will, what do you think will happen if we do this? 40,000. And let's copy 20,000 bytes over there. The 20,000 hex bytes into this address, hex 40,000. Make run. Let's try that again. What is happening? Hex 40,000 is the address of the kernel's code. What this does is it writes the data from the RAM disk, which is a bunch of garbage zeros, over the kernel's code. So once that copy completes, the processor tries to go on with its life, execute the next instruction. The next instruction is now garbage or zero, and that will very quickly cause the whole machine to take what's called a triple fault. In other words, you get one fault because you're accessing an invalid instruction. You get another fault because the attempt to handle that fault accesses a different invalid instruction, and then you get a third fault on top of that second one because the attempt to handle the second fault causes an invalid instruction. So three faults and the machine basically tries to save itself by rebooting. We've configured our operating system to just crash when it reboots, so that's why we see the window pop up and then disappear. Okay, so this is particularly bad, but any of these problems were bad problems. So. How can we solve this problem? Well, we have two different arguments, sort of sets of arguments to check. One of them is the memory that we're copying either into or out of, and the other is the offset and the size into the RAM disk. So let's check those separately. We'll do the RAM disk first, and before we actually, I'm going to start by introducing uh, sort of a framework for checking, and then we'll talk about how to check the RAM disk offsets. So what should we do if we get invalid uh, arguments? Well, what a normal system call does is it returns negative one, and that is what we will do as well. Let us assume that we have a check arguments function. We'll call this check, you know, read arguments. It will also apply to write. And what we're going to pass it is all of the arguments, and we're also going to pass it what system call is being called. And if check read arguments returns one, then we should actually perform the read. Otherwise, don't perform the read and set reg rax to negative one. Okay? So this is the sort of framework that we're going to use to check arguments. It's good to keep argument checking in a separate place. So let's write that function. So static int check read arguments. We have three arguments. We have a buffer. We have an offset. We have a size. And we have a fourth, which is the interrupt number. And we're going to start off by always returning one, because we're not checking our arguments yet. So how can we reason about offset and size? The RAM disk is like many buffers. It is just an array of memory. Um, its size is size of RAM disk. Uh, that, that is a true size because the RAM disk is declared as a character array. So size of RAM disk is equivalent to the size in bytes because the size of a character is always a byte. Um, like all such buffers, we it's best to think of the buffer as a half open interval. So what that means is that byte zero is allowable to access but byte size of RAM disk is not allowable. Okay, so we can access byte size of RAM disk minus one. We cannot access byte size of RAM disk. So that means it's closed on the left, square edges on the bracket, open on the right, open edge on the bracket. 
So normally what we expect is to get some uh, arguments for off and size like this. In other words, the offset and the offset plus size are both within the RAM disk, but there's more general kinds of uh, valid arguments that might get passed. Here are two. So first, we might pass an offset of zero and a size of size of RAM disk. And even though we can't access the byte size of RAM disk, because the range that we're copying from or to is also half open, that's a perfectly fine range. Fine, this one is a sort of a special case. If we pass the off of size of RAM disk, it should be allowed to read zero bytes from that offset. Because again, we are no that that, that that's reading zero bytes, right? It seems like reading zero bytes is usually allowed. Um, and that last byte is no larger than the last byte offset that we would pass to this, where we read the entire RAM disk. So we are going to allow reading zero bytes from offset size of RAM disk. Okay, so the pair of arguments size of RAM disk zero is valid. Uh, we're going to make it invalid if you to read zero bytes from a offset that's too large. So for instance, if you read from offset minus one, we're just going to make that invalid. But it should be valid to read zero bytes from the last possible offset. What about some invalid offsets? Here's what those might look like. It's invalid if offset is within range, but offset plus size is out of range. In other words, that would require us to read or write a byte that doesn't exist. It's invalid if both offset and offset plus size are out of range. It is also, this is also invalid. Now what's interesting about this is that offset is within range, offset plus size is within range, but thanks to an integer overflow, the actual bytes being referred to here are way out of range. We're accessing some bytes way off the end of the RAM disk. Okay? So here, this is the, the, the way that we can detect this case is that offset plus size is less than offset, and that should never be true. So if we were to synthesize both the things we want to allow and the things we want to disallow, we can, we can synthesize those into a simple two-step check. We want to verify, th this is the complete set of valid accesses. We want to verify that first off, off plus size is less than or equal to the size of the RAM disk. So we're not trying to read or write a byte that's out of range. And we want to verify that off plus size is greater than or equal to off. In other words, we want to check that there's no overflow. Now, is this valid? Does this uh, check involve any undefined behavior? It does not because all of these are unsigned numbers. And with unsigned numbers, there is no undefined behavior, unsigned integers. OK, so let's implement that. So if. It is not true that off plus size is less than or equal to size of RAM disk. Okay? Or it is not true that off plus size is greater than or equal to off, then return zero. Okay? Now if we wanted to simplify this, this is saying that if off plus size is greater than RAM disk, that's illegal. And if off plus size is less than off, that's illegal. So we're detecting whether things are illegal and returning zero. So what that should do is that should check, that, that should catch some errors. So this is our valid read. We should now check, we, we should catch this error, which before caused us to crash. So reading from a too large offset. I do a make run and see if it does in fact catch it. It does. So what we're seeing here is this is the number of bytes that were read, and that's negative one. That's the unsigned version of negative one. So we are correctly detecting an invalid read. Okay. Are we done? No, because we have not actually checked buff at all. We haven't checked whether it's valid to read or write buff. So this, is a, this check is a little bit more involved. Let's start with a very slow version of the check. So we could guess by, or, or approximate, have, a, have an approximation of a correct check by checking buff against the portion of memory that's reserved for the process. Um, so we would check that buff is greater than or equal to proc start adder and that buff plus size is less than or equal to the stack address of the process. We would refer to the memory layout 
to say that this application's code and data belongs in this region, so we would check that buff and buff plus size all fit within that region. But it turns out that's really not sufficient because some portions of that memory space are inaccessible. This process has a heap, the memory in between the code and data and the stack, and that, that memory is, at least logically, inaccessible. We shouldn't be allowed to access it. So what we should do instead is we should verify that the process has the right to access this memory. And the way to do that is by calling virtual memory lookup, which uses the current page table. There's only one page table in this operating system, remember, kernel page table. It verifies that in the current page table, uh, the, what are the permissions of a particular virtual address. So here's how we might do that. So we're going to start off with an address that's equal to the initial buffer. We're going to run until that address hits the last address that we will access. And we're going to increment by a single address at a time. And for each of those addresses, we're going to call virtual memory lookup. Now you could look up the, uh, the, the this function is defined in kernel.h, virtual memory lookup, here it is. This explains exactly what is returned. This is the same function that you have in your problem set. I'm just going to call it. So I'm going to get a VA mapping object, which is the result of calling virtual memory lookup on kernel page table with adder as an argument. And what we want is, since we're going to access this address, and we're accessing the address on behalf of the user, on behalf of the unprivileged process, so we want to verify that an unprivileged access is allowed. So we need PTEP, because we need the virtual memory to be present. We need PTEU, because an unprivileged access should be allowed. And if we're going to, if this is access is for writing, we need PTEW. Now, when is the access for writing? We are writing into the buffer if and only if the system call is a read. Because remember, a read is reading from the RAM disk and putting the result, smashing the result into the user's buffer. If it's a write system call, we're just reading the buffer, not writing to it. Okay? So let's implement that check. If it is not the case that the permission contains PTEP, or it is not the case that the permission contains PTEU, or we are doing a read, and it is not the case that the permission contains PTEW, return zero. Got it? Good. So what we should expect if we actually go back to our reader and implement the craziest sysread where we read over the kernel's data, this too now, the kernel has protected itself successfully. Because the kernel portion of virtual address space is marked as read only. Uh, to, well, sorry, it's, it's marked as inaccessible to user processes. Okay, So some things to note about this implementation. It doesn't look like we've handled that overflow. We don't need to handle overflow, actually, because in the in any uh, if if we provided arguments that overflowed, that would definitely overlap some with uh, uh, inaccessible memory, so it would fail. Secondly, this is a very slow implementation, very slow. Okay, so how could we speed it up? Well, the permissions are exactly the same for all of the bytes within a sec a single page. So one way that we could speed this up is only check once per page rather than checking once per address. And a way to do that would be to say adder equals round up adder plus one to the nearest page boundary. OK? We do the make run, again, everything works out. 
let uh, now I would want to take a little break here to think more carefully about the consequences of this roundup um, for addresses that are at the very end of the address space. I think we have an overflow problem. But in the interest of, so uh, if you're interested, think about that. We may return to it later, but in the interest of time, let's get on with the rest of the problem set. So we've now successfully checked our arguments to both sysread and syswrite, and we should move on to the next part of the exercise. Okay, now the rubber is hitting the road. We're going to do some memory mapping. Uncomment the body of pmapreader. Done. As before, we're going to fail, fail to compile because we don't have a sysm map. Okay, so what is this uh, crazy code doing? What this is doing is we're mapping a portion of the RAM disk into the user's memory. We're picking a, an address space, an, an address somewhere in the heap. That's what this, these lines do. And then supposedly the meaning of mmap is we're going to map directly the kernel's RAM disk memory into the process's memory space. Pretty cool. Um, after which we perform a bunch of reads. These are exactly the same reads that this that the P reader does, only we're accessing that data directly from the quote unquote buffer cache rather than calling a read system call. So let's return the reader to its original safe state and actually get on with implementing the system call. As before, we have three parts. We have a wrapper to implement, we have system call arg uh, numbers to add, and we have the kernel side to implement. So let's start with the wrapper. So sysmmap, what does it look like sysmmap is expected to take? So here's what I see here. I'm told the order of arguments, address, size, prot, offset. Those arguments are, well, the size and the offset are going to be size t's, as usual. Map is a char star, and this system call returns a char star. So and it looks like if the system call succeeds, it returns the same char star that, it, uh, that was its argument. OK, so let's implement that in the signature. So we're returning a char star. We're given a char star argument, the address. That's the first argument. The second argument is the size. The third argument is a prot constant. And the fourth argument is an offset. Now I happen to know that the prot constant is an int. How could you have figured that out? Well, our mmap function is based off of the Unix mmap function, and its prot constant is an int. But actually, you could have done any other type if you had wanted. OK, so the let us move on. We're calling the mmap system call. The first argument is an address. The second is a size. The third is a prot. And the fourth, which goes in rcx, that was explained above. The fourth argument would go in rcx, is the offset. OK, let's see if this compiles. Uh, we have two problems. We haven't declared int s in sys mmap. We'll do that shortly. And then also, return makes pointer from integer without a cast. Return result is making a pointer from an integer without a cast. Oh, I left result as an s size t. What we want here is a pointer value. That is the result of this system call. OK? Great. Now we move on to lib.h, which is where our system call numbers are defined. In sysmmap is now our sixth system call. We also need definitions for prot read and prot write. I'm just picking numbers out of a hat. OK, make run. Unexpected exceptions 54 because we have not yet implemented the, uh, the, system, the MMAP system call. So let's go ahead and implement that system call. And we're going to implement it without worrying too much about uh, argument validity first, and then we'll fix it up later. So I'm just copying the sysread case, but now we're implementing sysmmap. So what are the arguments? The first argument is an address, second is a size, 
the third is a prot, and the fourth, which is in RCX, is an offset. Okay, so I'm going to add in this check mmap arguments function, adder size prot off. Since there's only one mmap system call, I don't need the uh, interrupt number. Introduce that helper function. Check mmap arguments, the address, the offset, the prot, the size, and it's just going to say that the arguments are always valid. We'll fix that in a second. Okay, so what is the correct return value if the mmap succeeds? Well, that should be, remember, it's going to be the same, the address argument that we take in. So the actual mmap goes here. So how do we implement the mmap? We have a function for that. This is the virtual memory map function that you've seen in class. It is explained at length here. It takes six arguments, a page table, a virtual address, a physical address, a number of bytes, a permission, and an allocator. So all of these arguments will just fall right out of the arguments we already have. So virtual memory map. Which page table do we use? There's only one page table in this operating system. Which virtual address are we mapping? That is the virtual address that the user gave us, the address. What physical address should we use? Hmm. This is the physical address of the RAM disk that the user is trying to map, which is offset bytes into the RAM disk. How many bytes should we map? size bytes. And what permissions should we supply? We know that the memory wants to be present. We know that it wants to be unprivileged because that's the, the unprivileged process is attempting to actually map the memory. What about should the memory be writable? Well, we could make it always writable if we wanted, or we could actually check prot and make the memory writable only if prot is right. Our final argument is the allocator function. In this case, it's safe to pass null. In your problem set, you have to pass something other than null. Okay, let's take a look if this works. Not yet. Assignment makes integer from pointer without a cast. Line 169. There's line 169. Ah. Reg RAX is defined as an integer type, so I need to cast this back to a uint pointer t. Let's take a look at this. Beautiful. So what we're seeing here is alternating lines read and map read. Read and map read are synchronized, so they're always reading from the same offset. Read is reading by a system call. Map read is reading by just accessing the virtual memory map that it was uh, that that it produced at the at, at the start of its code, and what we're seeing is that read and map read are always reading exactly the same bytes. Okay, so when they read from the same location, they read the exact same bytes. So everything is working out just as we hoped it would. Next step. Memory mapping for writes. Uncomment the body of p map writer and recomment the body of p writer. Then add support for read write memory mapping. So it turns out we've already done this, but in order to prove it, we need to comment out map writer. Just going to comment out the write system call and uncomment comment out proc writer and p writer and uncomment map writer. Make run. So what we're, wa what we're waiting for here is for 61s to show up. And in fact, there they all are. See all of those 61s sort of creeping into the hex alphabet that we're used to from earlier work. So those 61s are appearing because MapWriter is writing to memory. That memory is located in its heap, 
but the memory is mapped so that it actually the physical memory being accessed is a physical memory associated with the RAM disk. So just plain memory writes in one process are affecting not only the data read by a system call, that's the read lines, but also the data read from another process's memory space, that's the map read lines. Okay? So, excellent. We are, uh, we're done with this portion of the exercise. So the exercise did ask us to be a little bit careful though. Um, if we supply bad arguments, we can probably ruin the kernel's life. Let's give an example of how to do that. Again, we have a bunch of different arguments. We have size, offset. Um, we have size, offset, address, all of these things. Did I do the arguments in the right order? I did the arguments in the right order. Good. Whew. I, thought, I was very confused if that had worked. So size protection offset, um, let us, I probably declared them in the wrong order in process.h, but it didn't end up mattering because I passed them in the order that they were provided. Eh, everything, everything's fine. Sorry for that, uh, that, that, that detour. Um, we have three relevant arguments that can be used to destroy the kernel. Again, they're an address, a size, and an offset. If we provide too large a size, we'll map physical memory that doesn't exist. If we provide a bad offset, we'll access physical memory that doesn't exist. That will cause a crash. But we can do something even meaner, which is we can just ask the kernel to please map over its own code. So I'm providing an address that corresponds to the kernel's own code. If I make run here, crash, crash. It's the same triple fault we discussed before. Once the RAM disk, which contains garbage, is mapped over the kernel's addresses, uh, faults are handled by the RAM disk, and the RAM disk contains no valid instructions. So that uh, crash is exactly what we would expect to happen. So let's fix this by checking our arguments. Going up to check mmap arguments, there's a number of checks that we need. As usual, if off plus size is greater than the size of the RAM disk, that's going to be a problem. If off plus size is less than off, that's going to be a problem. Okay. What else is going to be a problem? Well, for mapping, unlike reading, we need for everything to work out in terms of alignment as well as size. So we need the offset to be a multiple of page size. So if it's not a multiple of page size, that's a problem. We need the size to be a multiple of page size. So if that's not a multiple of page size, that's going to be a problem. These requirements are documented in the uh, virtual memory map uh, de uh, definition comment. We also need the address to be a multiple of page size. All those things are going to be problems too. Finally, we want to check that the memory being mapped is in the process's region of memory space. It better not overlap with the kernel. So there are different ways to do this check. What the way that I would do this check is uh, to sort of replicate this idea where we're checking that off plus size is less than or equal to RAM disk and off plus size is greater than or equal to off. What we want is for the arithmetic on the address should not wrap. So that means that uint pointer t adder plus size had better be not be less than uint pointer t adder. And furthermore, we want to make sure that the first address that we access, which is adder, is going to be greater than or equal to proc start adder. So that should prevent the user process from mapping over the kernel's address space. Make run, mmap failure. So that looks like another panic, but that panic is actually allowed that panic is happening because the map reader or the writer, I'm not sure, actually sure which one it is. I guess it's the writer because I modified the, the map writer to have a bad map attempt. It's actually panicking. So uh, we are now at the end of the exercise. We have successfully defined memory map.io for a tiny operating system kernel. I hope you enjoyed it.